Hey there, Brandon Harvey here. Before we get started, I wanted to give a quick shout out to the sponsor of this week's episode, Who Gives a Crap? Who Gives a Crap is determined to prove that toilet paper is about more than just wiping bums. They make all of their products, toilet paper, tissues, paper towels, with environmentally friendly materials, and they donate 50% of their profits to help build toilets for those in need. And get this, they just released a limited edition toilet paper, the Coloring Edition. They worked with iconic artist John Bergerman to create limited edition toilet paper wrapper designs you can color in. It is hilarious and amazing and absolutely something worth checking out before they disappear. Who Gives a Crap is offering Sounds Good listeners $10 off their first order with the promo code Sounds good. To get toilet paper delivered to your door, make a difference in the world, and support this podcast, just go to whogivesacrap.org slash sounds good and use the discount code sounds good. One more time, that's whogivesacrap.org slash sounds good with the discount code sounds good. Who gives a crap? Good for your bum, great for the world. All right, now here comes the show. As she became the first African-American woman to accept the prestigious Cecil B. DeMille Award at the Golden Globes, Oprah Winfrey had one message for the world. Tell your story, because you too can make a difference. She made it clear that speaking our truth is the most powerful tool we have. This message hit hard and true for my guest on the podcast today, Kendall Seesmeyer who understands that speaking her truth and telling her story has the power to make a ripple effect beyond imagination. And it has, despite the odds stacked against her. At age 11, Kendall, who was born with a rare liver disease, was awaiting a liver transplant when she saw a TV special on African AIDS orphans. It changed her life and marked the beginning of an organization she founded called kids caring for kids. Again, she was 11 years old. That night, she knew that she had seen the opportunity she was waiting for, her chance to give her life more purpose than the chronic liver disease she had grown up fighting against. The events and life turns that happen after this milestone in her life are wild. Like, I don't even want to say them during the intro because I don't know if you'll believe me. So I'll let Kendall explain them during our interview today. But I will give a slight spoiler and say that her work has allowed for her story to intersect with Oprah, Bill Clinton, Kim Kardashian West, Alice Marie Johnson, and Donald Trump at some point. Oh my gosh, it's wild. I am Brandon Harvey, and this is Sounds Good. This is the weekly podcast where we have conversations with inspiring people who are rejecting cynicism and using their lives to make an impact. Sounds Good is not your typical three steps to success podcast. We don't host this podcast for the sake of leaving you with bullet points on self-improvement. We deeply believe that our lives are more complex than that. So we show up here on Sounds Good to ask big questions, dive into nuance, and learn from each other's stories. I'm so excited for y'all to hear Kendall's story. She inspires me in so many ways. Let's dive straight into this. So Kendall, you wrote an incredible piece about Alice Marie Johnson that, spoiler alert, eventually led to Kim Kardashian West showing up at the White House to meet with President Donald Trump and led to Alice Marie Johnson being freed from prison after 20-something years uh, and getting to spend time in freedom with her family and her loved ones. Um, <laughs> that's, that's a remarkable sentence. <laughs> There's a lot that's going on there. Yeah. Before I kind of dive into anything, how does it feel to be in the midst of one of the wildest, but also most encouraging news stories of the year? Yeah, it feels totally wild to me too. So um, basically what ended up happening was I work for a company called Mike, and we're committed to telling stories of change, both the movements and the makers. And uh, I actually joined 
um, back in October of 2017. And um, what happened was uh, my boss, uh, Jake Horowitz, actually saw Alice's story. Um, Alice Skyped into a Google event um, probably six months prior to me arriving at Mike. And he just thought, wow, she's really captivating. Like we should really do something at Mike with her. Um, and so when I arrived um, and he had started this new uh, video team, we actually organized a Skype call and recorded a Skype interview. Um, so that's originally what it was. It was um, a video op-ed that we, we put together of, of Alice sharing her own story about uh, serving a life without parole sentence for a first-time nonviolent drug offense. And she had been in prison for 21 years. Uh, she was a 63-year-old great-grandmother um, and had obviously, you know, done something very wrong and was part of a drug conspiracy and was held up on those charges, but had clearly done a lot of really good things uh, since then serving her time and had been up for clemency three times, was denied three times, most recently by Obama. And after that, really felt like there was no hope. And um, we put out this story, and it immediately spurred kind of this viral reaction that we were not expecting. And, and before we jump into that next step, I just want to back up and hear a little bit about your side of things really quick, because yeah. I guess I'm curious had you been doing kind of video production stuff before this, before you joined Mike? Yeah. So um, I graduated college and um, always knew that I was going to dive into to the world of, of broadcast journalism is what I really kind of thought. Um, was there something in particular that inspired that direction? Yeah, actually there was. Um, I've known I wanted to do that since I was 11. Really? Um, I started, I uh, saw um, basically an Oprah show that really changed my life. And uh, I just then knew that I wanted to pursue uh, that kind of journalism and that kind of work so I could inspire. What was the show? Oh, it was um, this Oprah show called Oprah special called Christmas Kindness. And it was um, back in, wow, it's like so long ago, back in December of 2003. And Oprah had this huge Christmas party in South Africa where she showed these kids who were my age. I was 11 at the time who were coming to her Christmas party. And then after that, they, she showed their homes and they were living with no parents mm. um, and taking care of their younger siblings because both of their parents had died of AIDS. And um, that episode changed my entire life. Wow. Um, I sat there watching and felt like, I had never seen something like that before and was always almost angry that no one had told me about it and that no one had asked me for help. And was this the 90s in the midst of kind of the AIDS crisis? In It was in 03. So it was okay. like right when um, the AIDS epidemic was a, kind of becoming a, a big thing that people were talking about. In Africa, um, but in the US, things were a lot more kind of under control. Yes, yes, yes. Yep, absolutely. And so um, we'd kind of fixed our own AIDS problem in America, but but around the world, it was a huge, huge issue. Still is a huge issue, but it's it's significantly better today. Um, but the concept of, of, of children living without parents, I mean, I was so young. I was 11. I didn't even know what AIDS was. <laughs> but what really struck me were, were these this, you know, one girl in particular, her name was Candy Sile, and um, she was 13, and she had just lost both of her parents to AIDS and was taking care of two younger siblings um, living in a mud hut um, with no running water and no electricity. And I just felt, I felt that so hard. I, I, I just knew what it meant to go through something hard. Um, and I, just couldn't imagine having to 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 live like that and mm. to to be without my parents because my parents were were really my everything and so um i literally took action that night and it led me on this kind of crazy long journey um to start a nonprofit and and build an effort 
Um, but it was really since that as story. As a kid. Yeah, as a kid. Wow. Yeah, definitely. There's so many things to unpack within this. You're like raising back like it's no big deal. And I know it's your life, so it's something that you know you've experienced, but I'm like, this is remarkable. Like I watched TV shows when I was eleven and I didn't start a nonprofit. Like so I guess first of all, you watch this episode. Mm-hmm. Do you talk to your parents about it? Is is that kind of what catalyzes yeah. this? Or okay. So what what happened was I literally that night, um, you know, I was watching with my parents this like special and then it was time to go to bed. And so I went to my bedroom and I just stayed up. (laughs) Like (laughs) I just didn't go to bed. I stayed up and I actually Googled, I like went and searched on the computer, Googled AIDS orphans in Africa. And, um, well, cause on the episode they said $10 buys a uniform for a kid to go to school and you can't go to school there without a uniform. Yeah. I said, well, that makes no sense. And <laughs> I have $10. So I'm going to figure this out. So I, you know, what do you do when you don't know what to do? You Google it. Of course. And so I found World Vision originally, oh. uh, which is a world relief organization. They run an orphan sponsorship program. And uh, I found this little girl, eight years old, named Benit from Mauritania. And I was like, okay, that's it. Like, I'm going to adopt slash financially support Benit. So I literally pulled out in my dresser drawer, my like this wad of cash that was saved up birthday and Christmas money for my grandparents from like years and years and years. <laughs> and I took out another envelope and I addressed it to World Vision headquarters and I stuffed it, all my cash, $360 in, in the envelope and I went to my parents' bedroom and they were like, you know, what are you doing out of bed? And I said, well, I'm looking for a stamp. They're like, what are you doing out of bed? (laughs) And I said, I don't, I'm not going to tell you, which of course, you know, that doesn't really fly. That doesn't work. (laughs) Yeah. And so I finally had to tell them and they were like, okay, whoa, whoa, whoa. Like what's going on? (laughs) Um, And I said, well, I'm I'm adopting an AIDS orphan (laughs) and I just don't know if I should send $360 $360 all at once or $30 each month because it was really confusing. And I'm just looking for a stamp so I can just, just do it all at once. And my, my mom was like, Oh my gosh, well, like, let's look into this. Like, let's go have these, like <laughs> split it. That's a lot of money. And I'm like, no, no, this is my thing. I'm doing this. You can't tell me I'm not. And, and, you know, so obviously they had to like de-escalate the situation um, and figure out like what I was talking about, but um, they let me do it. And um, you know, I got months later, I got a letter back from the girl I was sponsoring and she was in school for the first time. And it just totally changed my whole concept of what you could do for other people. And I felt so empowered and I just knew I wanted to do more. And that really set me off on this whole long journey to kind of formalize my efforts slowly. Um, and I can keep going, <laughs> but there's obviously a lot oh, to that I, story. I want to, I, w- I want to keep on going. This is amazing. Okay. I, I, first of all, I love, I love so much that this foot in the door of, you know, $30 a month or however many dollars all at once, that's, you know, that's a small amount of money in the grand scheme of things. But what it did was it, it got your head in the game to think, okay, now what else can I do? Now how else can I get involved? Yeah. And it sounds like it was a catalyst for more. Yes. Help me bridge this gap between you saying, okay, here's an organization doing work in this regard. I'm going to send them money to saying, I'm going to do my own thing. Yeah. So um, originally it, it started small. Um, so I'll bring in another element of the story. Uh I was diagnosed with a rare liver disease when I was about two months old. Oh, wow. And so I always knew I was going to have a liver transplant. And um, it became more apparent at that time when I was 11 in fifth grade that I was going to need one sooner rather than later. And so when I saw this episode, it it was a kind of a compilation of things. It was like I knew I was going to have this transplant. Um, probably sooner rather than later, I was already listed, probably not going to get an organ off the list because it's literally impossible. It's not impossible, but it's hard. 
Um, you have to be really, really sick, especially if you live in major metropolitan areas. And I was from Chicago. And so my dad was actually got tested to be a, a donor. So, and he was a match. So I actually Wait, ended it's, up. It's for liver? It's for your liver? A liver. Yeah, a liver. So Do you we can, have multiple livers? No, but you can donate part of your liver because livers grow back. Oh, okay. So, so they, they generate, they like self-generate. Right, so your dad was so, a match. So you can take part of someone's liver and it can grow into a full thing. Wow. Okay. Which is amazing. That's incredible. Yeah. And so my dad was a match and we had like a date and it would be, it was going to be right after I finished my fifth grade year. And so kind of knowing that I was going to go through all of this um, and not really having any idea of what it meant Um, But having had surgeries growing up, I knew that people give you a lot of, you know, gifts and teddy bears (laughs) and people want to do things for you. I love where this is going. And it's a lot of attention. And to me, it was the last thing you would ever, ever, ever hear me talk about was this, like my deepest, darkest secret was that I had surgeries and I had scars on my stomach. Like it was something that I was deeply ashamed of when I was growing up because it made me feel different and I didn't like that. And so I knew that this was going to be a very public thing. I have a very tight knit community and I just so much wanted to have people focus on something else. And I don't actually know if I fully understood all of those feelings um, at the time, or if it was more simple of a, I want people to not give me gifts because that's there. I don't need anything. Yeah. And I certainly don't need like 20 teddy bears. Totally. So I worked with world vision originally to find a large community in, uh, Zambia, one of the most highly affected areas by the AIDS epidemic at the time. I picked that project. They had an annual budget of $60,000 and I said, okay, that's my goal. I'm going to raise $60,000. And my whole concept was like, okay, well, I have $10. My friend has $10. Her friend has $10. Like we all can just, you know, put it all together and we can raise a lot of money. Um, And that it didn't take a lot to make a big difference. And, And I wanted other young people like my friends to be aware of what was going on to other kids and also to be contributing to help, help them themselves. And so I kind of started the effort. Meanwhile, I was having two liver transplants. Um, So it originally was one liver transplant turned into two liver transplants. How did it turn into two? So, um, yeah, it, I essentially got an aneurysm of, uh, the hepatic artery, which is the major artery that feeds into your liver. And, uh, those are not good. (laughs) And, um, essentially what I've kind of come to know, um, because it was honestly a pretty, uh, I was so young. Um, and so I didn't actually know a lot what was going on at the time other than that I was really sick, but, um, essentially that kind of complication is something that happens to, uh, like 0.1% of, uh, people who have have transplants and the mortality rate is like 98% of people die from these things. And so I knew it was very serious at the time, but I was, I was in, um, a coma for a week. And so I kind of went into something and, didn't wake up. Um, and so I did, a lot of it is so fuzzy because, you know, you're under a lot of drugs to like make you not remember anything. And I remember waking up and going like, what just happened? Um, but eventually I got better enough to stabilize and everyone around me kept on saying, you're going to need a second transplant. Um, and the, I was in the ICU at the time. And of course I was like, I just had that. I just had a transplant. Yeah. I'm good, actually. Like, <laughs> that was good for me. <laughs> Hard enough. We're, we're fine here. Don't need a second transplant. But they were just so worried. The doctors were so worried because the literature just is not positive on these kinds of these complications. And so the idea of getting me stable was like the first issue and that they were all very concerned about it and had all their teams of doctors come in from Northwestern to try to like figure out how to deal with this because so few people had ever dealt with this. Um, And, you know, mostly they just find these things on autopsies. 
So it was really, really lucky that they had found it, found it um, when they did. And um, I don't really, again, like I don't really know a lot of what happened. Um, I had to actually call my doctor. Like I tracked her, my old doctor from like my old pediatric doctor for my whole life. I tracked her down oh, and wow. like recently and had a phone call and asked her what happened That's because funny. I wanted to know. Yeah. Um, what a weird thing to like not know a big part of your life. You know, that, that thing that's so significant and you're like, I don't really know. Yeah, I, like a huge significant thing. Um, and I knew, I guess, broad strokes of things. But when you try to like Google online, it just it's very dense, like medical terminology <laughs> and what kind of aneurysm was it? What does that mean? I know what brain, brain aneurysms are, but what did this look like? Why would you die? What were the concerns? Like there was a lot of talk of like that I was bleeding out. What does that mean? Like what happened in those circumstances? And honestly, like I never asked my parents because I think it's like, they say it's like the worst day of their entire life. Oh, and, and so I never really wanted to like make anyone relive that. I bet. Um, I bet. I've also, I've actually never told this story, which is, is pretty Whoa. interesting. I'm honored. Um, yeah. And so I ended up getting uh, relisted immediately um, and was in the ICU long enough to uh, be healthy enough to undergo a 13 hour operation, but sick enough to be in the ICU, which mm. is a very delicate balance yeah. and kind of the only way you can get an organ. And so that's your like status one when you're in the ICU. Oh, you're wow. like the next person to get it. So your it. first one was a portion from your dad's. Of my dad. And the second my one My second one is... was a deceased donor. Oh, wow. Yeah. And I actually know his family now, which is pretty wild. Um, that's incredible. He was a 24-year-old um, who died in a motocross accident. Um, his name is Aaron Kramer, and he was from Massachusetts, but died in a motocross accident in South Dakota. Whoa. Yeah. And he was an organ donor. And so his yeah, was an organ organs donor. got to go to yeah. people like you. Did, it, did other organs go to other people? Yeah. So his family's actually met the man who got his heart, oh, too. That's beautiful. That's huge. And I finally reached out to them. Like, there's all these rules around what you can, what you can do and what you can't do. Um, and if it's open or if it's closed, it's similar to adoption in the sense that like both parties are very viciously protected yeah. with laws. <laughs> and so there was a lot of laws saying I like, like essentially that we, we could send letters to them and we knew his name. Um, but we, we didn't really have any control over whether or not they contacted us back. And so actually year, years and years and years later after this, transplant, I um, found this page where it's like a legacy page or where people had written about him and his death. And, the, and his parents had actually shared an update kind of recently to when I was searching for it about this, about meeting the man who got his heart and how much it meant to them. And so I was like, well, you know, because this man who had gotten his heart was doing incredible things for people in the criminal justice system. And, and I don't, I don't know, I guess part of me just felt like, you know, part, a huge part of my story is about paying it forward and showing what happens when you can do that. And, you know, I take that responsibility very seriously. And I just thought maybe they would feel good knowing that I have taken it seriously. And, have tried to do good things for other people and wow. that, that their gift didn't go to waste. And do you feel like that really was your motivating factor in all of this was thinking like, I'm given this life. Like, what do you think that was? for I you? think there were a few factors. Yeah. I think first off, I grew up feeling, I grew up knowing and feeling that I was super different and feeling very alone in that. And that, that, that I just, there was just a lot of, stuff that no other kids around me had to deal with. And so I think I had this sense of empathy that was uh, probably well beyond my age. And I kind of was always the person in growing up that like really sought after the kids who were having a hard time, mm. whether it was the girl who was from the Czech Republic and, you know, didn't know a lick of English and her, my teacher sat me next to her so I could 
teach her and go to ESL with her. Or, you know, I just was constantly trying to like, I just gravitated towards other people that I thought understood uh, that feeling. Um, and I wanted to help them. And so I think when I saw these kids, the, you know, on the Oprah show, I just really identified with the, the struggle, right. And, um, wanted to do something to make it better because while I couldn't do anything about my situation, I could do something about someone else's. And that made me feel powerful, right. In a way that I was, you know, my favorite Bible verses, my grace is sufficient for you because my power is made in perfect weakness. And I think about that a lot. I think like here I was, am this like very, you know, weak individual and that the only way I could actually really be powerful was by being powerful for other people. And that was really what I had control over. And that felt like a really empowering thing that I didn't have to let my circumstance define me, but I could, define it all for myself. And I didn't have to be Kendall, the sick girl. I could be Kendall, the girl that was helping other people. Wow. And so there were like a few things I think that really led me to, to do kids caring for kids and to, to build it to what it became. The, the really, I think that at the end of the day, the empathy thing was the, the thing that most strongly kind of drew me to, to act. That is incredible. That's beautiful, man. There's so much to this. This is so cool. Um, what were some of the the success stories? Some of the things that uh, you know you are most proud of in in kind of the process of bringing this organization to life as a kid. Kids Caring for Kids essentially became a 501c3 back in January 2005. We'd been I was like a year out of not even a year out of my transplants. And so it became something that I just, after, you know, having both of the transplants that summer, we'd raised about $20,000 and just knew I wanted to keep on going. And so we, you know, my parents had a hard time saying to us, saying no to a sick <laughs> kid who to like wanted to help other people. Um, so we applied for your 501c3, got approved, and then just like ran this like very basement organization where we, you know, sold t-shirts and did penny wars and garage sales and bake sales and got other kids from other schools. And all of these kids started to do these things basically after reading my medical updates. So I'd like post medical updates on this site uh, called care pages that no longer exists um, because the internet has like outgrown it <laughs> essentially. Um, but this was like before blogs oh, wow. and before all of that. And, and so um, that was kind of my early days of communication, but it really decided, it just continued to snowball. Um, and so that became something that, uh, so many people were involved in. And I think what I'm most proud of is, is the kind of tangible impacts, right? Like building a high school or, oh, wow. uh, building a computer lab or, you know, helping to, kind of uh, in install indoor plumbing at this this school. So we worked on a few different projects with different partner organizations. Were those around the world? Were those in Zambia? So they were all in um, sub-Saharan Africa. Cool. So mostly Zambia and South Africa, but also Kenya. Um, and then one project in Ethiopia for a brief period of time. Have you ever visited any of the projects? I have, yes. Oh, what was that like? When did you do that? Oh, so I did that uh, the summer after my junior year of high school. Whoa. And so we were about like eight years in already. Um, so it'd been a long time of working on something without having really anything but pictures and stories. Uh, because going to uh, some of these countries, it's very difficult for me because I have a suppressed immune system because I've had two liver transplants. Oh. So very, very hard. Um because if I get something, it's like a really, really big deal. And um, so, yeah, I had to be really careful. Um, but we went and visited our projects um, in Zambia and South Africa. And uh, one school in particular that we worked with for a while um, is called the Life Song School for, for Orphans. And it's um, a K or pre-K through now 12th grade school that serves um, children who are double or single orphans. Mm. Um, and it's a, it's a private school in Kitwe, Zambia. And um, it was just 
so amazing to go and to actually like see meet and like see the people who are on the ground um, meet the kids who are on the ground like it gave me a, like a whole new sense of of impetus to like continue on Good. and yeah I mean I think it was overwhelming re- really like I think I never had any intention of kids cared for kids becoming what it did it was really driven by like one heart action which was like me seeing this show wow did you end up getting some like big attention like did I perhaps I did, see yeah. the name of uh, of the president of the United States at the time? Yeah, yeah. <laughs> nice. <laughs> I see how you did that. Um, <laughs> yeah, so when I was 14, actually, so um, we had raised about $120,000 from, like, bake sales. <laughs> and Whoa. Penny War is, like, literally, truly kids, like, doing these things. Which to me, I think is the other cool thing that I'm, I've am always been super proud of is that um, it truly was kids running this organization <laughs> f- for other kids. Mm. And it was like kids doing the work and it was kids doing the fundraising. Um, and I'd get letters from like eight-year-olds in Florida who hosted a, a lemonade stand every weekend of the summer oh, and raised $300. And like... That's so amazing because I think for me, it was also about inspiring a generation of givers, right? And like, how do you build people into, uh, you know, givers that will continue on in that habit for the rest of their life? I want to hear the stories of all of these people who are impacted by you and like learned this art of, of giving and generosity because you were the catalyst initially. This is, this is so inspiring. <laughs> yeah, I mean, it was really cool. And it was really cool to get letters back from, like, classrooms who would, you know, learn because we built, like, educational curriculum for our teachers and we did all these things. But um, as you were referring to, when I was 14, basically one day President Clinton uh, came to my high school. <laughs> I was a freshman in high school and it was like my second week of high school. Is that cool or embarrassing? It was overwhelming. <laughs> it was so <laughs> overwhelming. I was it was like I go to a I went to a big, big public high school. So about like twenty two hundred oh, students. Wow. And so we were all packed into this gym and no one knew what was going on. It was like this kind of surprise assembly that everyone was kind of very obscure. No one knew even the teachers didn't know what was happening. And so we get in the assembly and then our principal and us is president clinton and everyone's like what is he doing here (laughs) that's so random because he wasn't the president at the time but so he had just written this book called giving about how anyone can make a difference and basically he started talking about you know how our school was such a giving school and i was like oh that's kind of weird we're no different than anyone else (laughs) and then he said i want to acknowledge one person at, at your school and he said my name and i just totally freaked out because I was, you know, so new to the school, um, so young. I actually was sick that day. I had a fever and I wasn't actually sure if I should be at school. Um, The day before I had stayed home from school and was thinking, am I liver sick? Am I regular sick? Should I go to the hospital? Should I not? And so that was obviously um, kind of at the forefront of my mind. But I really wanted to go and my mom, you know, kind of knew, she knew the night before. So she basically pushed me out of the door. And the whole thing is such a crazy story in itself. But he announced to everyone what I was doing and then said he was going to take me with him to be on the Oprah show. So I rode down in a presidential motorcade with President Clinton to be on the Oprah show. Yeah, that day, right then and there, literally right then. (laughs) (laughs) So... I get like whisked out of school to like go down and I'm like driving in the presidential motorcade and they're telling me all of this stuff. And I'm thinking, what (laughs) I'm, what am I wearing? (laughs) I don't know. I don't know. I was like, no idea. And, um, I was on the Oprah show that day with president Clinton, um, on an episode focused on his book about giving. And I was in a real world example of someone doing that essentially in one of the commercial breaks it got crazier um someone uh whispered into president clinton's ear and then oprah when it came back to the show oprah asked him to announce what 
had happened, what had been whispered in his ear. And someone who was traveling with President Clinton had decided to donate half a million dollars to my nonprofit Whoa. right then and there. Whoa. And so everything changed. I think um, Kids Caring for Kids exploded in a way that we certainly were not prepared for. We rebuilt our website in the weekend prior to the show running because it was a taped show. And, um, you know, I, I announced a goal of raising a certain amount of money and like a million dollars. And, and the whole thing was just so wild. We started getting requests from basically everywhere in the world for me to come speak and do all these things. And all these kids wanted to do fundraisers. And, you know, here we were just like me and my mom and my dad and my brother just going, oh my gosh, like, what do we do? (laughs) We were not prepared for this. (laughs) Um, And then obviously had a whole lot of money to do a lot of good with, which was, was also very exciting. Um, And to figure out how to run like a really responsible and uh, professional nonprofit. Yeah, because it was originally $10 at a time. Because it was so small. It was like peanuts. And we were had, we had momentum, but we certainly did not have our act together in a way that we were like a real organization. I mean, we were real as much as like me and my dad and my mom, like going out and talking to like Boy Scouts and Girl Scouts, you know but not like international real. And so uh, that was an interesting time. Um, And it certainly changed, I think, you know, what kids caring for kids would, would become. And, and then I think by at that point, what, what would, how my life would kind of change from that too um, was very, very interesting. What was high school like then? As somebody who <laughs> that's a good had, question, had, Brandon. <laughs> had millions of dollars under your control, but also you know you're picking things out. You're also speaking. You're getting asked to speak. What the heck is that even like? <laughs> yeah. Well, my parents were really good about really kind of like protecting me and like basically saying you're going to be a normal kid um, and you're going to do normal kid things and like in our extra time you can do these other things. <laughs> so they were good because. You know, I think it could have been totally a different story. And I th- I actually don't really, I don't actually really know all that kind of came through our inbox at that time because I was so young and my parents were really kind of just taking care of all, like, you know, making, sorting through what's, what's good, what's bad, that kind yeah. of thing. Um, and doing their best, I'm sure. Um, but yeah, it was, it was a lot of, I felt a little bit, this sounds so dumb, but I felt a little bit like I was living a double life, um, because I kept my, I kept my, you know, high school life. So high school, because I, you know, just had so much, um, attention on me. And I think it was really hard because originally everyone was really excited about it at school. And then everyone really wanted to like figure out all the reasons they didn't like me. Mm. (laughs) Um, And so it became something that I was like so sensitive about and I would never talk about at school. I never did any kind of projects around it at school. I like completely it separated it because, you know, you deal with mean girls or mean kids in general, and then you just never want to, you never want it to be near you. And, you know, other things would happen and People would write articles or something and my teachers would pin them up in their classrooms. And I just knew that there would be bad days if that had happened. Like I knew that if an article were to come out, I would have like a bad day at school um, or a bad week because people would be really mean. Uh, Um, I think that everyone really just wanted to fit everyone into one box. and, And I just knew that I was doing something good. And so I needed to keep on going regardless of anyone, what anyone else said. And the other really interesting piece of this whole story is that I was still really sick. Like I had a lot of complications for my second transplant and I dealt with a complication that required me to have a procedure under general anesthesia every six weeks Whoa. Um, for 11 years <laughs> after my second transplant, 11 years. Wow. And uh, they tried to do surgery to fix it, and it didn't work. It was like a 13-hour surgery a couple of years after, and it didn't work. And so um, I was just living with this complication, trying to just do my best, but always knowing at a moment's notice, 
I could come into, you know, a scenario where I needed immediate medical attention for a, an infection that would soon to become a blood infection that would be really kind of dangerous very quickly. Um, and so I was kind of living these like very separate in these very separate worlds where I'd have these really, really high highs and really, really low lows and, um, and then going to high school in between <laughs> and trying to be like a normal high school kid in a very un- not normal circumstance. Um, and so it was a lot to navigate. And I would say it was kind of lonely at times. Um, but it's weird looking back on it kind of all and, and seeing how I navigated it because I, I really think I just did what I could when I could yeah. and try to, I don't know, do my best to move past hard things and continue on. But I definitely, uh, high school was a hard period. <laughs> it was a hard, it was a hard time in my life. Wow. I can't imagine what that's like, you know, having essentially you've got struggles with kind of your social life at high school. You also have medical struggles all at the same time that you're doing something ambitious, which is hard in and of itself. Wow. Okay. That- I think I was born an overcompensator. <laughs> <laughs> and and so I think I just so deeply didn't want anyone to ever think I was not good enough. Mm. Um, and I'm sure that came from some kind of like you know, deep feelings of shame and pain in my, in myself. Um, but I, I think I just went so hard at life because I, I never knew what was going to happen. And I just wanted to make sure that I made the most of everything. And I wanted to make sure that it was all on my terms, even yeah. if, if, even if most of my life was not on my terms, I wanted to pretend that it was. That's really understandable, I think. Yeah, I think so too. So you are kind of getting ready to leave high school and it sounds like maybe that that was exciting and a breath of fresh air and and a kind of an escape. Did you know at that point that you wanted to go down the journalism world specifically? Yeah, I always knew. I think I always knew. Um and and I just kind of didn't really know how to pursue that in in high school. Um and I didn't really know how to pursue that in middle school, yeah. obviously. Um, and so I knew that eventually that's where I wanted my life to lead because I think the the thing that's kind of consistent in my life is that I want to share stories that matter. And I think that I started doing that when I was young through Kids Caring for Kids, um, sharing that one particular story that really mattered yeah. to me. And, you know, I think I see my job now working in journalism is just kind of a extension on that. I just want to share stories that matter and I want to inspire people to act. And so in a similar way that I felt inspired to act after watching a story, I want to create that kind of change in other people because I certainly know what kind of impact it can make in, in my life in, in people's lives. Yeah. Um, and to be able to kind of spur that kind of action is is the dream. You are speaking my language right now. I love this idea of how stories have the power to remind people of the good that can be done in the world and then ultimately be a catalyst for people to take action because it, it's so personally impactful and then just like on a bigger scale, really impactful when you do get to take that action. But the stories have to come first. And so you show up at Mike. Yeah. Is your first story this story with Alice Marie Johnson? It's not my first story, but it was like maybe my like, it was the first month. It was the, I think like the third week I was there. Wow. Yeah. And and so I pursued journalism in college, did all that kind of thing and worked for CBS this morning oh, cool. in the 2016 presidential election, did that whole thing and really kind of struggled because Kids Caring for Kids, we um, uh, had a larger organization adopt it as its kids branch. Got it. Because um, you weren't a kid anymore. Because I wasn't a kid anymore because I knew that I didn't want to run it as my full-time job. Um, and I continued working on it throughout college and it just became – really difficult to balance that with the competing interest of uh, pursuing journalism, honestly, um, and pursuing this other kind of career. And 
so that was a really kind of a hard, painful process, yeah. but ended up finding a great partner and um, people I really felt comfortable with. Um, and, and honestly, to this day, it's, it's such a different variation of what it was. But to me, it, it doesn't really matter because I think Kids Caring for Kids has always been a vehicle to inspire people to do other do good things for other people. That's and cool. as long as that's happening in some form, I'm I feel good about it. That's awesome. Um, and, and so that took me a while to kind of grapple with just because it was such a huge part of my identity and my life. It was like, you know, a huge, I mean, my 12, you know, 13 years of my life working on something. And at that point when I, we had someone kind of a larger organization adopt it. I mean, that was like half of my life working on kids caring for kids. And so that was an interesting decision. Um, and, and finding Mike was certainly a, a blessing in disguise I had, you know, quit a job that I was really unhappy with and was really kind of going through it in the, uh, what do I, who am I? What do I want to do? How do I, like, I don't even know anymore. Um, you know, I must took a job in tech PR. (laughs) It really, it had some dark days. (laughs) It was a, it was a, it was an interesting time, which I think is natural. I think a lot of people go through that after college. And I just, it was so foreign for me because I always was so clear on what I wanted and what I thought I wanted to do. And like I hit a little bit of a road bump and felt like kind of really discouraged from my first place of work and just wasn't sure anymore. Um, and I was actually really surprised by myself that I let that um, deter me because I don't, I'd really never let anything else deter me. Um, and so, yeah, I landed at Mike, which was an incredible uh, choice and fell into this situation where we had, uh, you know, this incredible story to share. And I ended up getting to interview Alice and produce the piece on her. And then, continue to follow her journey, um, to clemency. Uh, so it was, it's been a a ride. I love that journey. I love that there's so many different things that all are coming together and the common thread isn't one necessarily like, isn't necessarily one niche of making a difference. The common thread is making a difference or it's the common thread is empathy or the common thread is action. Like it's, yeah. it's this broader thing that you've brought together so many different aspects of your life. Yeah. I think it's, that is something that's super hard for people. Um, especially when they've committed, you know, a lot of themselves to one thing. It's like, well, how do you reinvent yourself and, and pursue something else that you're interested in? Especially when you, you know, are a founder of something or, you know, or just spend a lot of your time committed to one one entity. Uh, and for me, I really was always inspired by Cory Booker who said like, don't, I don't aspire to, uh, hold a position. I aspire to live a mission. Mm, and that's good. I, that really kind of like, that was really good. It was really good. It just like totally like opened my eyes to the idea that I didn't have to hold a position. It was significantly more important that I aspired to a mission. Oh. And so I, okay, I'm okay. Whatever I do within this greater, you know, umbrella is fitting. And so I'm going to let my, myself explore and my life explore all these different kinds of paths as long as they touch that. And that will be the guiding principle of my life um, is, is if I'm touching on helping elevate voices that I, you know, believe the world needs to hear. And so whether that's through a charity, an organization, whether that's through stories, whether being a journalist, whatever kind of storytelling, you know, venue or method that takes, um, that's really what I want to do. And I think that Mike has really taught me that it can be, it's possible. (laughs) Man. Which is cool. That's so cool. And so at Mike, you've got this story where uh, you've got Alice Marie Johnson who you know, was incarcerated for life as a first time offender for a nonviolent crime. And you basically were just talking about this as kind of a a grander story with this interview and it goes public and then it goes viral. Like tell me about those first 24, 48 hours of it, of it blowing up. So 
there were a couple of iterations of it, right? So there's the first was the big public announcement. So essentially what happened was Kim, um, there was an article that came out about a month after our piece that said that Kim Kardashian was looking into the cases of Sintoya Brown and um, Alice Marie Johnson. And this is after she had, we'd published our first piece with Alice. Kim had retweeted it. I think that's how I saw the piece initially was Kim retweeting it. Yeah. That was a big deal. Yeah. She commented on it like, this is heartbreaking, retweeted it, shared it with her followers it like exploded our video online. All these other celebrities were tweeting about Broke it. Broke records. Yeah, totally. Um, and um, basically, like, a, a, you know, we kept on going on and doing other stories. And, you know, we did something with Alice's daughter, but we also pursued a variety of other things um, and kind of moved on. Um, and always kind of in the back of our heads thinking, she could get out maybe. Like, maybe, wow. like, we'll follow this, I guess. And so we um, saw the article a month later that Kim was interested in this case. And we're like, wait, what? (laughs) She's doing what with Alice Johnson? And it was very vague, but said she was like looking into getting involved in the cases of these two women. And uh, so we were like on a mad dash. And when I say we, I mean me and the the guy I work with, Jake Horowitz, who's actually the co-founder of Mike. Um, and so the, together we were on this kind of wild goose chase to, to find Kim and get in contact with her and to figure out what she, what she was doing. How did you get in touch with her? Yeah. So we like, we finally What's got in number? touch with her. Just kidding. People. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. Not going to tell you that. <laughs> Understood. Um, we finally got in touch with her team and, um, you know, we ended up actually meeting Kim, um, in the audience at March for our lives. Oh, cool. Uh, and said, hey, like, we did this story on Alice. And it quickly kind of spurred into this thing where, you know, we got went out to L.A. and actually did a sit-down interview with Kim about why she was wanting to get involved and that she had been talking to the White House. And then we broke that story, and that story went m- massively viral. Um, you know, Kim Kardashian was in talks with the White House about Alice Marie Johnson. And that's a big deal because it's this remarkable thing. And I saw this tweet that week that they said something along the lines of somehow Kim Kardashian has found a way to have this conversation with the white house to, to kind of do a deal and to kind of use her celebrity to make a difference in this white house without tarnishing our respect for her. It's, is this remarkable and unique thing that she was able to pull off because there's so many people who have gone to work in the White House or have have gone to like advocate for something with the president and people have have thought less of them afterwards, just kind of publicly. Yeah. And somehow you guys break this story and people go, well, you know what? I think Kim can do it. (laughs) Like, that's amazing. Yeah. Well, I I think, you know, she definitely did get a lot of, um, flack yeah. for it. <laughs> a lot of people had a lot of things to say. But, you know, I think that's the case with anything. Um, she was involved long, long, long before anyone else knew about it. And um, so, you know, to me, I just always think that, um, you know, her intentions were very pure in this. Um, yeah. And that's really what we experienced. That's really cool. And um, yeah, it was really cool. And basically what happened was She ended up going to the White House, Um, so we followed her there and did the whole kind of behind the scenes with her, ride to, ride from, um, in the hotel after, talking to her, interviewing her, and then, uh, you know, continued along in in telling the story of Alice. And so I went out and shot interviews with basically all of her family members, all of her children, yeah, I mean, just was really kind of trying to tell this this full story um, because it's not just the Kim story. It's also the Alice story. And uh, I think that's really important to remember. And every family member of Alice and this whole greater life that she's missing out on because she's in jail. Yeah, absolutely. You know, she had five children um, and four were living. And so we went out and visited all four of them, um, interviewed all of them. Um, I spent like so many months traveling, um, oh, I bet. <laughs> not really sleeping in my bed, which was interesting and just on nonstop. Um, and you know, between Kim and between Alice, like kind of going back and forth, telling both sides of the story. Um, and then, 
was actually in Memphis with um, Alice's family members, with Alice's son and grandson, when uh, we got the news that Trump had granted her clemency. Uh, so actually got to tell them that it had happened and then went, did the whole drive down with, with the family to, to prison to, to pick up Alice outside of um, the, the facility that she was being held in. And um, out, <laughs> ironically, Aliceville, Alabama oh was where she was being held. So we, we did that whole drive down, drive back, got her, there was a, obviously a huge media circus yep. outside and just kind of continued to tell the story. We were there, you know, that whole night when she'd gotten out and um, interviewed her immediately and were there with her family. They had this huge party. Um, you know, half of the relatives went down to, to Alabama and then half of them stayed in Memphis and um, prepared a party uh, with like every every family member they have, uh, which was it was just such an incredible experience to witness all of it and to be a part of all of it and to and be a, a catalyst for all of it. I mean, you weren't just a part of it, but like yeah, there were so many people involved in the story, and there were amazing lawyers at the case, and there were a lot of factors, and um, you know, I think. To even be a small part of like that story uh, is just something I never could have ever imagined or predicted. And I think, uh, you know, to go back to the idea of inspiring other people to, to do good in the world, it just so happened that that person was Kim Kardashian. And that's totally random, but very cool that it actually, you know, you, that's my goal is to, to tell stories that inspire people to act and and it's very clear that that's what happened, which is more than I could ever have have asked for. That is so incredible. It's interesting because, you know, you you had this journey where, you know, you had an impact mm -hmm. as a kid and then you, you were trying to figure out later, okay, now what am I doing? And you had maybe a quarter life crisis and you found a, a, a really great deal of success your first month into this new job. Uh, I guess, first of all, like, what does that feel like? Does that feel like, does it feel lucky or does it feel like, you know, the outcome of years and years of sticking to a mission? I don't believe in luck. So I'll just say that, um, you know, I think I try to live my life very intentionally and certainly that landed in my lap and I felt that way, truly. Um, I think we did awesome work on the story, but you know, that was being at the right place at the right time, um, I think, in a lot of ways. And I think it's all about, you know, preparation meets opportunity kind of thing. Uh, but really, to me, honestly, like, the whole thing felt so much more touched by something bigger than me. Uh, and, I, you know, I think faith has always been a really important part of my life. And I really feel like that that was the role I felt God was playing was, you know, orchestrating this, this story to, to be something. And I don't know, it, to me personally, it was really incredible to watch just the people that were involved because I don't think that anyone would have expected that, 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 you know, Donald Trump and Kim Kardashian could come together to do this, I think is not something that people would have predicted, certainly not what I would have predicted. And to me, it was really kind of a deeper message of God can do anything with anyone. God using and aligning all of these different people to do something that he wanted to do in a circumstance that no one, certainly no one expected because, you know, again, she had been denied three times and denied by Obama, who had been really, really big on, on um, granting clemency. So, you know, under this administration for this to happen felt like such a huge feat that was just so unlikely. Um, yeah. And I, I think as far as my greater life, you know, when I'm looking at it and how it impacted my life, I think it made me think, like, keep doing what you're doing and keep sticking to what you're, what you believe you're supposed to be doing here. And, and that's kind of what I've thought my whole mm. life is I just need to do what I think I'm here to do. And 
maybe I won't get always get it right. Maybe it, it certainly won't be easy, but that if God wants you there, God will put you there. And, you know, I think, I believe he makes a way when there's no way I really do. And so that's just how I live my life. And I'm, I'm not here to say that I always believe that or really feel that, especially, you know, when I was really struggling post-grad, uh, you know, another really interesting piece of this story is that I ended up finding this surgeon um, who fixed my complication, my 11-year complication from my transplant, my second transplant. He um, was the only person in the world who thought he could fix this issue. Everyone else disagreed with him, including my own doctors. And uh, he fixed it. And wow. I am healthier than I've ever been in my entire life. And I think I hit that point after I graduated and I had this whole life and I had these huge struggles and, and all of a sudden I was free from this constant resistance. Um, and I had nothing kind of pushing up against me and, and I was just so lost. I had no idea how to live. And, and, and that sounds really strange to most people, but I think when you're in a certain situation, you grow, you adapt to it. And to me, struggle was something I adapted to. It was something that was always in my face. My constant, my worst fear was always in my face and I had no control over it. So I just, I just like went hard and I just like balled out on life and really just went at it because I had no fear because my fear was with me always. And so that, that was my greatest fear. So everything else seemed small. Mm. And so now like, after I graduated and I had this crazy surgery that no one ever thought I could have. And it took a year to decide whether or not to have it because it was so risky and all of these things, all of this buildup. And then all of a sudden I was, I was like, it was over. <laughs> um, and I, I didn't have this constant fear in my life in the same way anymore. And I think that it really threw me for a loop and I had to figure out, okay, well, who am I? Now that I don't run Kids Caring for Kids, now that I don't have this constant struggle in my life, who am I? What do I want to do? Now that I'm free from all of these things, it was almost like the the freedom of it all was the scary. It was something I hadn't anticipated being so scary. And so learning to retrust and re kind of center myself in who I always was, that I didn't lose any part of who I was because all of those big life changes had happened. I was still the same person, kind of grounding myself in who I've always been and what I've always valued was the thing I think that has allowed me to continue on the path of living out the mission. Like I had a road bump, I wasn't sure what I was doing, and then I like refound it. And and that's how I feel now. I feel like I've refound it. So I think that this was certainly, again, like I said, right place, right time. But in a lot of ways, it feels like, no, you just found the mission again. Honestly, I feel like I need a lot of time to process everything Kendall shared in our conversation. It is just so wild to think about how our lives are constantly turning pages and things come that we never could have or would have predicted for ourselves. Oh my gosh, like so many parts of Kendall's story. Yet they change us forever and they can change the lives of other people. My hope is that this conversation leaves you feeling more hopeful and less overwhelmed. Kendall's story reminds me that we are not our circumstances and there is so much impact that happens when we choose to help others despite whatever adversity we may be facing. On that note, I hope you're inspired to follow Kendall as her story continues to unfold. I've been following her for a while now, and actually in the time between recording this episode and releasing it, she went to the White House again. So go dive into that, follow her, etc. on Instagram and Twitter. On top of that, you can check out all of her professional work at Mike and her upcoming speaking engagements on her official website at kendallcsmeyer.com. If you're new to Sounds Good, we would love for you to stick around. 
you'd also love my conversations with Tiffany Mitchell and Esme Wang, both women who are living with creative ambition in the face of adversity. You can find both of these episodes and more than 100 other episodes by searching for Sounds Good wherever you listen to podcasts. Make sure you hit subscribe to keep getting more inspiring conversations with incredible people delivered to your phone while you sleep. And for those of you who are regular listeners to the podcast, please consider supporting the show by leaving us a review on Apple Podcasts. This podcast is created by me, Brandon Harvey, as a part of Good Good Good, a community that believes in the power of celebrating good news and becoming good news. Chad Michael Snavely and the team at CM Studio edit makes the show, and Christy Karenbrock offers production support. You can get lots of hopeful stories on social media by following us everywhere at Good 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 CO. We also create a beautiful quarterly newspaper that celebrates the people, ideas, and movements that are changing the world for the better. It's called The Good Newspaper, and we actually just released our newest issue. Issue 5 holds pages and pages of stories that are full of real, messy hope. And you can order it today. Check it out at the link in our show notes and see what else we do at goodgoodgood at goodgoodgood.co. And on that note, that is a wrap for this week's episode. Go out and remember to see your boldness, your vision, and your particular spark in the world as an opportunity to inspire others to persevere and to engage in the world. Sound good?